great city of Victoria. I was reflecting on this. It was five years ago this month uh, that we were the luncheon uh, sponsor hosting former Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Polos. It was June of 2018. And that was a remarkable luncheon with a number of valuable insights and lessons. But I was talking to Peter earlier and probably the single most important thing that I heard and learned from the governor was that he assured all of us that he sleeps like a baby every night. He wakes up screaming every few hours. So my first question for the deputy governor is, do you too sleep like a baby every night? In any event, I took this five-year anniversary as an opportunity to look back at some of the data from what the world looked like back in June of 2018, and four very important points stood out for me. The first is that the Bank of Canada rate was one and a quarter percent in 2018, and as of yesterday, it's four and three quarters percent. Five-year fixed mortgages at that time were ranging from three to four percent, and in some cases, they're over six percent now. And very importantly, in May of 2018, Prince Harry and Meghan got married. And in June of 2018, President Trump began exchanging love letters with Kim Jong-un. So my second question for the gov Deputy Governor is, uh, will these two love stories prevail longer than these lofty interest rates? And if you could address that during your remarks, I would be appreciative. In any event, Deputy Governor Baudry, welcome to the Chamber and welcome to Victoria. Thank you for taking the time to join us here today and, and making Victoria one of your stops. And to Bruce and your team, thank you for a wonderful event. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you, Mark. Okay, we're going to bring the Deputy Governor up right now. I love these opportunities when we have a chance to, I assume, bring someone from the exotic east, from Ottawa or from Toronto, and bring them here to show them this weather, especially when we bring them here in the wintertime. So I was going to sort of say to the Deputy Minister, this beautiful place, you should just sell your house and move out here. Well, he lives in Vancouver, so... Don't get that pitch happening today. Paul Beaudry became the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada in 2019. In his role, he oversees the bank's financial system activities and shares responsibility for setting monetary policy. Since 2021, he also oversees the bank's analysis of international economic developments in support of monetary policy decisions, serving as the bank's G7 and G20 Deputy. Before coming to the bank, Mr. Beaudry spent 25 years as a professor at UBC. He's also held academic positions at Oxford University, Boston University, Université de Montréal, and was a visiting professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also Pantheon Sorbonne University and Université de Toulouse. Mr. Beaudry held a Canada Research Chair in Economics from 2000 to 2015 and is a two-time recipient of the Bank of Canada's Research Fellowship Award. He was born in Montreal. Mr. Beaudry holds a BA in Economics from Laval University in Quebec City. Oh no, you were born in Quebec City lived in Quebec City. He'll tell you all about it. Uh, he has an MA in economics from the University of British Columbia and a PhD in economics from Princeton University. Would you please welcome a very smart man, the Deputy Governor, uh, Mar uh, sorry, uh, Paul Beaudry, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, Paul Beaudry. <laughs> Bonjour à tous. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Even if I only came from uh, Vancouver, I still love kind of coming to Victoria. Uh, I come often. I kind of try to take advantage of such a beautiful place. Usually, I try to bring my bike, you know, maybe go down the Galloping Goose Trail, go down out to Souk, kind of see the potholes, or hike down the Juan de Fuca Trail, see the surfers out there. So I could go on and on about, you know, uh, all the great things to do out here. But I hope you won't be disappointed. I'll talk about interest rates instead. So that's going to be uh, the, the general subject. And in particular, I'm going to talk two things that I'm going to talk about today. So on the first part, I'm going to talk about the idea of our decision yesterday, trying to give you an idea of what made us kind of decide that, what we were looking at, how we make those type of decisions, and kind of cover that and kind of give you a good idea there. Then I want to kind of take a step back, okay? So often things are being asked about longer term. So I want to kind of ask, you know, two, three years out, further out, once this inflation kind of episode should be under control and everything, where should we be going on interest rates, okay? Now, when I'm going to be talking about that, that's going to be this much longer term aspect. Now, that's important. As all of you kind of know, when you're taking kind of big decisions, you're not only talking about interest rates in the short run. You kind of need to know 
what interest rates might be in the longer run, and in particular this idea of are we kind of entering an era of higher interest rates, kind of getting at that. And kind of, so I'll try to look back a bit, what kind of brought us to where we were pre-pandemic, uh, going through things, and then where we think about uh, going forward on that, kind of in these kind of long-term type of sense, not so much the just direct uh, monetary policy that will have that, that first part. Now I won't uh, kind of make believe that I have all the answers, it'll be more kind of giving the risks around what is happening. So giving you an idea of the type of uncertainties, what kind of forces could be affecting things looking out further. Um, donc, qu'est-ce que je vais essayer de couvrir aujourd'hui, c'est ces deux sujets. Un, de regarder à court terme, qu'est-ce qui, qu qui se passe, qu'est-ce qu'on a décidé hier, et je vais essayer de donner une idée à long terme, qu'est-ce qui se passe, plus long, à regarder de deux ans, trois ans et plus loin dans le futur. OK, so let me dive in right away on kind of yesterday's uh, decision. Now, yesterday, as I think uh, all of you know, what we did was we increased uh, the interest rate by a quarter of a percent. But that was like the first rise uh, since January when we had decided to take a pause on interest rates. So I want to go back. When we decided to take a pause in January, we said we needed to take a pause on this to try to assess how much the monetary tightening and the interest rate increases we had done up to then, which, you know, over a year we had kind of gone from a quarter percent to four and a half percent, which was a big part how that was really affecting the economy and whether it was going to be allowing us to be enough to get inflation back down to 2%. We said at that point that we'd be looking for an accumulation of evidence of whether things are kind of, kind of developing in the way that will allow that to happen or that we'd have to kind of reconsider. Okay? So if we go back to our uh, April decision, already in April we were already seeing a set of forces that were kind of uh, getting us worried about that aspect of whether we had had enough monetary tightening. And we kind of thought at that point whether we might have to increase rates. And that kind of came out. We have this summary of deliberations which kind of discusses the issues we've, we've brought up. In particular, we were seeing certain things. Since, this, um, since we started the pause, just repeatedly we've been surprised about the strength of the labor market. How much, you know, that's been a very robust type of labor market. Unemployment has stayed at these historical lows. We've also been kind of uh, the aspect of looking how core inflation. So we have the standard inflation that you see, kind of the average of all the prices. But there's an aspect that we call core inflation, which is more uh, taking out the more volatile aspects like energy and food and looking at underlying trends and we kind of want to think that helps us think more about what could happen to inflation going forward so we often look at these core measures and they've been kind of more sticky and not kind of coming down very uh, very quickly and those were the type of things that we were we were looking at we saw all sorts of elements so we already kind of picking up what's happened since then since that April decision well data's come in in a way to tip that balance we've kind of seen different things so we've had an accumulation of evidence on many fronts over time and across a whole set that tell us uh, now that inflation seems to be more sticky and it's going to be harder to get it down to that, uh, that 2%. And it's that accumulation of evidence that kind of brought us to our decision yesterday. So I'm going to go through some of those pieces of evidence that was from the April part to now. So thinking first about economic activity. So we were first surprised on the upside from the kind of growth in the first quarter. So the national accounts came out and we were kind of predicting more of a 2.3 and it kind of came up at 3.1. So that doesn't look too bad. But when we look in kind of the details, what we notice is what's the big driver there is consumption. Consumption came in at 5.8% growth. That's very high growth. And it was very broad based on across a whole bunch of, of aspects here. So if we're looking like services, not surprising, you know, with the pandemic and things, services went down and we've kind of seen them kind of coming up. But we thought by now they'd be kind of slowly kind of easing off in terms of that kind of growth rate. And no, we didn't see that. The services just continued. Even more surprising, goods had been taking off. Like we, you know, a lot of people bought a lot of goods during the pandemic and things, and we kind of thought, you know, that would be showing. And it was kind of going down for a while. And now it's ticked back, back up. And it's that aspect that really kind of suggests this kind of strength in the economy. Now we've spent quite a bit of time kind of asking, okay, what's happening here? Could this just be reflecting the kind of changes in uh, the immigration coming out, coming in, which is quite strong? Could it just be that pent up demand that's in the background? Could it be uh, different aspects that's still in the supply chains? We went through all that, but by the end, all those things were playing a role, but by the end we really felt the momentum in the economy is still 
uh, very strong, and that's the aspect that we are kind of noticing there. And we again see it in the in the labor market. Okay, unemployment is still at this. Uh, historical low. We are seeing vacancies come down a bit, so we are seeing monetary policy kind of having some bite, but it's actually been uh, slower than we, uh, we've been thinking. We've also spent quite a bit of time looking at directly the inflation numbers. Okay, so the, the last inflation number came in at 4.4, and that was actually an increase. We hadn't had an increase in, in the inflation rate for almost like uh, 10 months, and that was actually an increase from the, the previous month. Not by much, just went up from 4.3 to 4.4, but it's kind of going in the wrong direction. We were expecting it to kind of come back down. And again there, when we looked at kind of more in detail what was happening when we were looking at these core measures of inflation, the inflation parts that we think is kind of really gets ingrained and kind of entrenched in the system, that was no more showing any kind of this uh, decreasing part. So now when we look forward here over the next few months, we still expect this headline aspect, so the standard number of inflation, should be coming down and by the aspect of kind of coming down maybe to 3%, probably close to 3% by, by the summer. But that's almost all driven by uh, the price of oil. These aspects underlying are not coming down. So the, why the oil price matters, these are yearly measures. So it's kind of like saying last year oil was a lot more expensive than it is now. And that's really what's kind of giving that decline in that, uh, that part. But to really fi figure out what's happening, we kind of look at those core measures and we've uh, been more worried about that. So uh, in summary, when we look at this, this aspect through this, uh, through this lens of both looking at the dynamics of inflation combined with excess demand, this very high activity levels, that really has increased the risk that we're not going to be able to kind of get our inflation down without a bit more monetary tightening. And it's that accumulation of evidence that led us to kind of our, our decision yesterday. Donc, uh, juste en résumé, qu'est-ce qu'on a, on a vu avec uh, la, la dynamique des, des prix de, de l'inflation fondamentale combiné avec la demande excédentaire, nous a vraiment donné l'idée que l'inflation ne reviendrait pas au taux qu'on voudrait à 2 et c'est ça qui nous a amené à avoir notre décision hier. So, now, really want to kind of stress here that we understand that, you know, Raising rates are hard on a lot of Canadians, and this is kind of something we take very seriously. At the same time, inflation is also hard on a lot of Canadians. Inflation is especially hard on people on fixed, uh, fixed incomes or people with uh, low incomes. So we have to kind of think, you know, we're trying to uh, improve that, that aspect at the same time. That's our responsibility, bringing that inflation down. And by bringing it down, we really want to reduce that anxiety and those difficulties in our system where we don't know what's going to happen next, how much uh, our income will be able to buy, and that's really our goal, and that's where we're kind of aiming for, and that's why we take this, and uh, like I say, we, we understand that it's, it's a difficult thing, but we really think that the main aspect is to bring that inflation back down, get it back down to our 2% target. Okay, so that was a little bit my overview of kind of how we were thinking about uh, our decision yesterday. Now, like I said, I'm going to take a step back and kind of look more at this longer term. So I want to kind of go a bit further out Okay, thinking not what's ha happening, you know, right now or the next, you know, year or kind of up to, you know, as long as this inflation's around, but looking further out and kind of trying to understand what's going to happen there. Okay, but to do that, I'm going to do things in steps. Okay, to kind of get an idea what brought us to, you know, the pre-pandemic levels of interest rates. What were the forces there, such that we can kind of try to look forward and what would be forces that might have changed things. Okay, this should work, but do I have to open anything or kind of turn something on? Okay, uh, there, a bit, uh, yes, okay. So, so this is basically, there's three rates uh, of interest here, kind of it doesn't matter too much because they're doing all the same similar type of thing. So we have rates on conventional mortgages, that would be five years here. We have 10-year bond yields, we have business loans. The striking thing is this is kind of the 25-year the period prior to the pandemic, and the thing that most of you kind of know is how much interest rates fell during that period. It's almost like a, just a, a direct downward trend. You know, these rates were up at kind of the 9% level of kind of in the, uh, the mid-90s and just continues kind of declining to be more kind of close to kind of 3%, the pre-pandemic type of aspect, okay? So what we want to understand is what are the type of things that were driving these type of movements, okay? such that we can kind of try to think, are they kind of reversing or not, and how we might think about them going forward, okay? Now, 
Oh, someone changed that. Did I change that right away? Can I just go back? Well, I leave that one up. Anyways, okay, thanks. Okay, um, so to understand the kind of, uh, the, let me go back to this one. Oh, well. Okay, let me do, leave that one. Okay, I'll tell you what that is in a second. Um, so, so when we want to think about some of these changes, there's going to be different notions of interest rates that I'm going to try to, to talk about. There's going to be three notions, nominal interest rates, real interest rates, and neutral rates. So that sounds like a lot, okay? I'll make it, it won't be too complicated. Let's do it by steps, okay? The, the nominal interest rate is just the interest rate we're all used to. It's the rate you see the bank, a bank telling you, or when we're kind of at 475, that's a nominal interest rate. The real interest rate, which I'll be talking about quite a bit for a moment, is that rate minus the rate of inflation, okay? And the real interest rate is really an important concept because it really is telling you, like, if you're going to save, how much you get really from savings is the real interest rate, or if you're boring, really what the cost of boring is is really the real interest rate. So just to give you an idea on the savings part, just to give you an example, I know, you know, Victoria is a really beautiful place, but, you know, sometimes you might think, okay, I'll take a vacation. Suppose you're thinking going to the Okanagan for a vacation, you get, you have $2,000. You could say, well, I could take that right away, or I could put it in the bank and kind of wait a few years, let's suppose three years, okay, and then kind of go there. Oh, this is good. I put it in the bank, and suppose we're at 5% interest and 2% inflation, okay? Well, if I put it in the bank for three years and I have 2,000, okay, I have 2,300. Okay, I say, ah, oh, yeah, good, $300 more. Oh, but wait, things are going to cost more then. So if inflation's at 2%, okay, over those three years, then the, the, this uh, money kind of I can only buy, it'll cost me more like 2,120. So really what I get by, by saving is really $180 worth. That's that 3%, the 5 minus 2, that's the real rate. That's really the kind of return you get on your money. It's the, the aspect of taking that nominal rate minus uh, the inflation rate, and that tells you how really it kind of the, the value of savings or the cost of borrowing. So this line here is the real interest rate on 10-year uh, Government of Canada bonds over this same period. Now, if you look at that, it kind of looks a lot like the other diagrams I told you before, except that everything's a bit lower and everything's about lower by 2%, okay? That's our inflation level, which was very stable through that whole period, and it's almost like step down. So here, instead of being more in that kind of eight area where it was before, it kind of started more like at six, and it went down. And this is the part, notice that end part, very close to zero. This was this world where we kind of started noticing we're almost in this zero interest rate environment if you looked in real terms. That was like almost no gain on savings, and there's kind of very little cost, really a boring much, because you're really at that kind of low aspect. So what the question is, is, is this the type of thing where, you know, we're going to stick there or not? And we kind of got to ask some questions there, trying to understand that. Now, one of the things, so this is the Canadian data. Now, let me put a few other countries on top, okay? So I have the, the U.S., I have France, Germany, so uh, several of the advanced economies. I think you can kind of see what I'm going to say next. This is very, very common across all these countries. This is not a Canadian-specific type aspect here. This is something that's very drawn here about how this kind of uh, real interest rates on kind of 10-year uh, bonds kind of uh, moved across here. And so if we're going to think about things, we have to think, why is it that, uh, that common component about those, uh, those interest rates? Now, here when we start thinking about these are rates on kind of 10-year bonds, when we're out past five, 10 years, and you know, economists don't agree on a lot of things, but most economists agree when you start looking out further like this on rates on five, 10 years, kind of looking out, that's kind of a lot uh, above a lot of forces that are just driven by monetary policy. So you really want to think in that, in that era that kind of those long run forces are something more structural that's happening to the economy. And that's where I'm going to get to the notion of, of the neutral rate, okay? And this is the harder one, okay? So we did, did uh, nominal rates, real rates, and I'm going to talk about this notion of, of a neutral rate, okay? I'm going to try to give you an idea how, how we're going to think about that. Now, the neutral rate is like an anchor in the system, okay? And I'm going to tell you how it kind of gets to thinking about it. It kind of holds down a whole set of interest rates, but think about the interest rate we see as like the boat on the top of the water there. When things are choppy, it's all moving around, but there's still this whole thing holding it. 
So what I want to kind of think is, when things get back to normal, where is that anchor? Okay? And that's that neutral rate there. Okay? And so we're going to want to kind of decompose things to understand that neutral rate. Now, I'm hoping you know, uh, a lot of you are kind of used to thinking uh, just simple supply and demand here. So where does the neutral rate kind of, where does it come from? What's the structural aspect? What the neutral rate is trying, the real neutral rate, is trying to equate what are the demands uh, for capital in the economy relative to the amount of savings that there is in the economy, the, the desired savings versus the need uh, in the system. And it's that aspect that kind of decides the neutral rate in the system. That's the underlying anchor. Now, on top of that, there's all sorts of other things. Like I was saying, this bubbly part like we're living right now, we have the inflation parts, we've had war and pandemic, that's moving things around. But the underlying aspect is that there's a real rate that's trying to equilibrate this aspect. We have to understand that part. Now, in that neutral rate, if we get savings increasing, so that would be an increasing in savings, more we save, more that pushes down that neutral rate. Okay? Now, we're going to try to understand what are the type of things that might have kind of pushed down that savings. Flip side, if there's less demand for capital, that'll also push down that neutral rate. So these are the, the type of forces that kind of could break it down. So I want to kind of start thinking about what are things that over this period prior to the pandemic were kind of affecting either the supply of savings or that uh, the demand for capital uh, through the economy. Now when we're thinking about this, you mustn't think that this is just Canada. Coming back to those, all those real rates, this is the, the neutral rates trying to equilibrate this for all the economies that are kind of tied together in the world financial system. That's really the real neutral rate that kind of pulls things together. So this is, I want to think about these things in terms of that global economy part, okay? So when we're looking forward, we want to understand that. Now, I'm not going to go through all the things that could happen. I'm going to go through four things that kind of were important in this part, kind of that could affect that, uh, that particular neutral rate, explaining why things came down like that for that 25-year uh, that period. Well, first, there's demographics, okay? This is true in Canada. It's true in most of the advanced economies. What are the type of forces that mattered? the baby boom kind of went through this whole, this whole period, okay? So in the beginning of that period, it was still quite, quite young. And as we kind of know, what happens in terms of savings is, you know, when you're younger, you're kind of more boring and trying to get things going. And as things kind of you know, get uh, older, you have to start thinking about retirement. You start kind of trying to accumulate for retirement, getting closer and closer to retirement. That creates. So when, as the baby boom was kind of going through the system, it was cr increasing the savings rate all through that, that part. So that's one force that's kind of pushing, was pushing things down. A second part, what was important over this period? Well, the integration of an economy like China into our, uh, into our financial system. Now, China is a, an economy that tends to save a lot. Like, there's a whole set of reasons why it saves a lot, including that, you know, there has, there's less of a social s safety net that makes it, there's good reasons to have a lot of savings. The financial system traditionally was less developed. There's lots of savings. There's all sorts of things. And this is true of, you know, lots of uh, uh, East Asian economies. They integrated. That was a lot of boost to savings. It kind of brought into the world economy a lot of savings because there was a lot of savings in those, uh, in those countries. During this period also, it was a kind of rise in the um, and globalization, and especially for companies that have, you know, a lot of network type of structures, there's a lot of kind of uh, profits that were made, and inequality at the world level actually increased quite a bit. Now in Canada, actually, we've stayed kind of you know, much less of that kind of big movements in inequality, but if you look at the world level, there's really been this kind of, you know, creation of, let's say, a lot of billionaires, for example. When you have more inequality, obviously rich people can save more than poor people, so that's also a push on savings. So all those together were all things that were kind of pushing down that savings rate, kind of pushing us down and having that lower real, uh, real rate. Now, if it was only that part of the savings, we should have had a great boom in investment off uh, all the economies. This is kind of, so there's this extra part, which we call the missing investment puzzle at this point. So during that period, actually investment hasn't been specially strong. This is not only in Canada, it's across uh, all the advanced economies. It, ha it wasn't a period of very strong kind of growth. And trying to figure out that, there's more debates of exactly that, but there's a, a lot of kind of different elements that kind of help us, you know, think of what might have kind of created that. Uh, there's an aspect of the type of technologies that were happening at that point. Um, again, coming back to some of those network externalities, it made it harder for 
small firms to kind of come in and kind of compete against some of the big, big players. That might have reduced the investment parts. Maybe some of the kind of easy gains had been done in, kind of in previous times. There's also the kind of new kind of capital that was kind of built was less good for kind of putting out and being used as collateral. A lot of information capital is a lot different than buildings to kind of use as backstrap. So there's this aspect that also investment demand went down. But what these two things go together is what it gives you at the end is a very low real rate. Okay? So that's kind of looking back. So obviously, looking backwards is always easier than looking forward. So that was the easy part. Now I want to kind of look a bit forward and say, okay, how do we think about that going forward? So that means we have to think of those same elements and think what was happening, uh, what might happen. Now, again here, this is where whenever you're looking forward, there's going to be a lot more uh, debate about it. And this is things that there's a lot more debate about among economists of how that might develop. More recently, and both at the bank and a lot of other places have been kind of looking at this, now, the IMF, for example, just came out with uh, their study and saying, up to now, the forces that were there kind of pre-pandemic, kind of that brought this down, haven't, seemed, haven't reversed yet. So we're still thinking we might go back afterwards to a system that was well, these kind of rates that we had prior to the pandemic. And when we did it at the Bank of Canada, we kind of came to the same conclusion. Okay? These things are not, haven't shown yet this kind of reversal part. And so what we had is kind of like our estimate for the real neutral rate, so that aspect of that anchor that pulls down the system, is maybe between 0 and 1%, and which means that the nominal rate would be that plus our 2% inflation, so somewhere between 2 and 3%. So that's like a base case. But what I want to push you around is thinking about the risk. So it's, you know, a base case in a, a very uncertain environment is not kind of telling you that much. You really want to know if the risk or are kind of balanced around there or kind of they're tilted some, some way. Well, what I want to uh, kind of discuss today is giving this idea that they seem to be tilted much more to the upside. So it might be that we're going down there, but you know, there's much more chance that if it's not there, it'll be higher than that, than, than lower than what it was. And why is that? Well, let's go through some of the elements that kind of brought things down as I was going before, okay? Back to that demographics uh, and aging. Well, I kind of sold, told you, like, the baby boom went through this whole period, kind of saving and saving and saving. Well, now a lot of that baby boom is either retired or retiring, and we'll get into a period where it stops saving and actually starts spending, okay? And so that's the aspect that that isn't that same source of savings that we had before. The same thing. Actually, that's not only kind of in, um, in the advanced economies of... Uh, the idea that in China, because of the one-child policy, it's also a country that's actually aging quite quickly, and we have the same type of thing. There doesn't seem to be a country that's you know, the same type of thing that'll be integrating the, uh, the financial market in the same way that China integrated with high savings that would be pushing that down. So again, if we look at the risk, it seems like those things are kind of uh, both the upside of kind of reducing that savings over time. The rising inequality, as we see some of these geopolitical tensions, it might be that that aspect of having these huge markets might be reduced a bit, and that might affect inequality. But even more, as we're kind of like coming back to this aging, a lot of the inequalities also between young people and old people, as we've kind of gone through this aging process and we have less young people, that reduces that inequality and also that reduces some of that savings. On the investment side, well, again, investment's really hard to predict, but, you know, we have a huge kind of climate transition to put. If things kind of work out, we'll need a lot of investment to get that through. Those are the type of things that might create more demand for capital at the same time. And as we hear a lot, you know, there's uh, artificial intelligence is really kind of coming up with lots of new things right now. That might also create a whole bunch of opportunities and new investments. Now, again, all those things are speculative but they seem to be tilted all on one side, okay? So we have our base case that we might get back and at the flip side, it might be that um, uh, it might be higher. So that's the general kind of uh, idea that I want to get. Why is that important for you and me? What's, what, why would I tell you this? Well, it means have to think ahead and plan with that uncertainty in mind. Okay? That aspect of thinking, okay, it might come back. So if we look further out, again, want to stress, these are global structural forces when we're looking further out. It's not... Uh, just monetary forces, it's these global forces. When we're looking further out, yes, we might come back to this pre-pandemic um, pre type of environment of interest rates, or we might enter this higher 
uh, environment. And you need to kind of, everyone needs to think that through and be ready. So when taking out decisions, uh, be ready to do that. So, en résumé ici, quand on regarde qu ce qui s'est passé dans le passé, on peut voir quelles, quelles sont les forces qui nous ont descendu le taux d'intérêt sur cette période. Mais quand on regarde de devant, il a, maintenant, il y a des risques, et les risques semblent être plutôt à la hausse versus de qu ce qu'on avait avant. Et donc, qu'est-ce que ça nous dit? Il faut essayer de penser d'avance et être préparé pour ce type d'éventualité. Now, now, again, I want to finish by really you know, stressing, we don't take our, our interest rates decisions like yesterday lightly, okay? These are important things, and I, I do recognize that it's uh, difficult on, on many people, but I really think inflation's also been very difficult, and that's why, you know, we really want to bring back inflation, bring it back to a level where basically people stop talking about it. That was the great part of being in our 2% inflation environment, was that people didn't have to worry. You could go out, do your business, do your things without only worry. That difference between real rates and nominal rates just become a small part in the overall picture. When there's these high rates, that kind of uncertainty, the uncertainty that creates that anxiety that has and creates actually a lot of social tension. That's all what we want to bring down, and that's why we're committed, and that's why the Bank of Canada will bring it back down to 2%. Thank you, and open up for questions. Hey, thank you, Mr. Beaudry. That's very entertaining. I, I wanted to just ask you one thing off the top. When decisions are made by the Bank of Canada, uh, very often uh, either complaints or credit are given to the government for decisions made by the Bank of Canada. So, in the simplest form, what is the relationship of the Bank of Canada with the government of Canada? Yeah, so, so you know, we're independent. So they actually don't have a say on where we kind of decide on our okay. decisions like that. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Minister Freeland yesterday, I, I think she made it very clear that that was exactly the case. And they actually, you know, kind of came out and kind of discussed our, our decision, but uh, clearly saying that she didn't have anything to say. Now. That's, that's in the Bank of Canada Act. We're an independent central bank, we kind of decide that. But at the same time, we have to be accountable. And what happens are we have a structure that every five years we get an agreement with the government to kind of the goal of what monetary policy. So we have implementation independence that we kind of decide what is good for Canada. And during that time, the government doesn't come in and kind of tell us what to do. And we kind of decide we have a mandate and right now our mandate is this 2% inflation target and that's what we're aiming to do. As it's often said, uh, when the United States sneezes, we get a cold. So we hear about things in the States through the Treasury and all that. So it's, how does our system differ from the States? So it's not as different as you'd think. Like, so again, they have a Federal Reserve System, and more or less you can think a lot about the Federal Reserve System at a high level. It works a lot like ours. Now there's things in particular, it has a regional branch type of system, okay? Uh, so there's representation from the you know, regions that go through that. So there's little things in terms of the structure, but they, you know, they kind of work very much the same way, an independent uh, way from the government. Now, they have a slight different. One of the reasons you hear more about them is they don't work with a consensus system. So we have a decision way at the, uh, at the interest rate decisions in, at the Bank of Canada. So we're six people on the governing council that decide interest rates. And we decide together in a consensus way, we try to come to a consensus. And so when we go out afterwards, we kind of hit a consensus and we go and say, we explain to people where we are. We don't give our own little bits of uh, opinion of different things. We try to give that consensus part. In the US, it's a vote system. Each person is directly known, so you can know each person how they vote. It has advantages and disadvantages. We think the consensus system is a better system for Canada and we work on the consensus system. Great, thank you. Okay, questions from the floor if you have a question. Uh, please feel free to ask it. Just raise your hand or stand, and we will come to you with a microphone, and you can ask the question directly to Mr. Beaudry. So anybody, just feel free to jump up, put your hand up. There's one now. If you could just uh, state your name and your affiliation, please. Okay. My name's Stephen Calderwood, and I'm with Remax. The question today is, we know that there's two ways to look at uh, controlling inflation. We, we've come through this terrible pandemic, and if... Um, the uh, repair to the supply chains is also contributing to lower inflation and your actions at the Bank of Canada is contributing to the lower inflation. How much do you think these two factors, if these were the only two factors, how much do you think proportionally is due to, do to the uh, recovery from the pandemic and how much is due to your interest rates increasing? Okay, 
So, so first of all, there's exactly, so the, the initial part of how this inflation started was a lot of those supply chain type aspects. So what we saw at the beginning was exactly this part where, you know, through the pandemic, in particular, we wanted to buy a whole bunch of goods and there's a certain amount of capacity that could kind of hit those goods and that increased uh, aspects. Now, those supply chains really kind of pushed up things to begin with and then it starts getting into the system, okay? And what now a lot of those supply chains are kind of uh, fixed up and that's helped in the part that's kind of declined partly over this period. We have that part that's, that's helped. But now inflation's kind of come more across in a whole set of ish, uh, areas, and this has become very broad based, a whole set of areas which aren't directly related to the supply chains. And a lot of those are kind of solved now, and that's why we have to get that kind of aspect of pushing it back where we have inflation in all sorts of areas now, and that's really where the interest rate is trying to, uh, trying to slow down that demand such that that supply can kind of catch up on that way. Now that the supply chains are a lot better, that's really the only tool we kind of have to really bring things back now. In the world of money right now, we're also hearing about uh, digital currency, cryptocurrency, all that stuff. Where, where does that impact the Bank of Canada and how will it impact us? Okay, so on, on that front, let's, uh, so right now, and it's kind of, uh, it's all open for everyone, we're having a consultation. So we're thinking of, uh, you know, whether Canada would kind of, you know, needs or not a central bank digital currency. So it's not, not crypto like Bitcoin, it really would be the equivalent of the cash that we have in hand, but something that would be digital as opposed to having it that when you want cash. And we're trying to figure out, you know, do Canadians want this? Would they need it? By the end, that would be actually a, a decision by the government to decide if we'd have one. But we at the Bank of Canada are looking into it, kind of looking at the possibilities, and looking at is, is this an option that Canadians would need? Like, is this something that you'd like to have as an option to be able to hold uh, Canadian dollars in a digital form instead of having it like right now you're indirectly holding it let's say through you know your your uh, your bank account and different things but would you like to have something that's not going through uh, bank accounts and that you're kind of holding it directly and so yes we're kind of looking at that but it's a quite different object it wouldn't be using the same kind of energy aspect that kind of something like Bitcoin has it's not the same structure this would be backed like the Bank of Canada exactly like uh, the dollars that you can have in your wallet right now Great, thank you. Um, over there, oh, over there first. Name and affiliation, John. Uh, John Trelevin, Grumpy Taxpayers of Greater Victoria. Uh, Mr. Deputy Governor, in a healthcare context, a very difficult decision for a doctor is to put a patient on a ventilator. Because most patients that go on a ventilator don't survive. Because of COVID, the private sector in this country, one way or another, was put on a ventilator that has had to close down, rely on government programs of one kind or another, uh, and generally the economy was weakened for a healthcare purpose. In the healthcare context, the most difficult thing to do is to remove the patient from the ventilator. That's the, mix, the, the point of maximum stress. You talked about risks in interest rate policy and the deliberations of the Bank of Canada. What risk do you assign to an unsuccessful withdrawal of the private sector, large swaths of it, say the 98 or 98 percent small business, from programs that are gradually terminating? And what are you going to do about that, or what should be done to ensure the patient survives what was a healthcare crisis-induced uh, ventilator process? Okay, let Thank me you. just may make sure here. So. I'm not the government that was asked a bit before, okay? I'm at the Bank of Canada, okay? So this is where, you know, we try to let governments do what they do. They're elected, they have different things, they're kind of warring up. We take all that on board. Whatever governments are doing, the kind of policies they take on, we try to figure out how that means for the economy, what it means for inflation, we take that on board. We don't tell them what to do, they don't tell us what to do. Sorry, <laughs> there can't be more, more getting into things. Uh, we'll go to this side of the room. Oh, no. Hi, just yeah. uh, your name and affiliation, please. David Adams of uh, Ferris. Uh, my question, you answered the question I think that I was going to ask. It wasn't about health care, but what it was was the, 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 you haven't mentioned, and perhaps you can't because of the separation between the, your bank and, and, the, and the government, is that it has been said by many, some, 
that it's like driving a car with one foot on the brake and one on the accelerator at the same time. You're putting the brake on, the, running the huge deficits that we're running in this country are pouring gas on the fire. I don't know whether you can comment on that. But to I me, to I me it comment. looks like that. I mean, to me it looks like the federal fiscal policies are contributing to the higher inflation. So, so right now when we look, so when we kind of, I'm like saying, we take all this stuff on board. So this is why I can comment. It's not like, you know, we take it all on board both at the provincial level and at the federal level, looking at all that together. And right now, that spending at both the federal and provincial together is growing at about the rate of potential growth in the economy. So at potential growth, what you'd say there is basically it's not helping or hurting relative to this. It's kind of like we'd like, you know, if it could help us more, that would be great, but it's not, but it's not. So it's more like being neutral on one side and kind of on the, uh, on the uh, you know, we're kind of the, the one that's trying to control kind of getting things down. But it's much more the size of things is about the growth of the government spending in Canada at this moment is about at the speed of the growth of potential. So it's really not kind of pushing in either way. Thank you. Sir. Uh, okay. um, Matt Dell, City Council in Victoria. My question is about the interprovincial approach. You haven't mess uh, mentioned anything about the different provinces. Do you look at uh, how the different provinces are doing, and perhaps particularly around housing prices? Obviously, in British Columbia, we have very high prices. Uh, a lot of, for example, young people right now bought houses way more expensive than in other parts of the country. They're dealing with these higher mortgage rates, uh, you know, compared to a two hundred thousand dollar home in the Maritimes. Do you look at the provinces and do you look at particularly land and, and housing and building prices? Yeah, so we, we do a lot. So again, so there's two parts to that answer. First, monetary policy is a very blunt instrument. We get only got to choose one thing for the country. But as we try to do that kind of decision of what's good for the country, that means looking at not only kind of within you know, each province, but also looking at the individuals and kind of there's a very huge variety, like it's affecting people very differently. And we try to get a whole aspect of figuring out you know, how indebted people are, how much that's going to affect them, which groups, where, different things. But by the end of the day, we have to set something that is at the national level. So we have to aggregate all that information up and decide what's best for Canada as a whole, but that's using all that information. So yes, we do. And we have uh, as a side to that, we have our local offices. So we have an office in Vancouver, we have one in Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, and they're all picking up. So I don't know, I'm guessing some of you, like from the uh, Vancouver office, you've probably been contacted. You know, that's one of the aspects that the, uh, um, our Vancouver office does is pick you know, all the information, especially in, the, in Western Canada, to kind of transmit that, what's happening. And so yes, we do get all that. But like I say, by the end, we have to set one interest rate, that's the aspect of, uh, in Canada, how it, you know, we're integrated. So yes, we take in a lot of information, we try to kind of parse that out, but uh, by the end we take one decision. Have you thought of opening a, an office in Victoria? Yeah, that's, it could be, yeah. Provincial capital, yep. lovely place to live. Exactly. Uh, the point made about the cost of real estate though, that was a factor on inflation across the country, even if it's a $200,000 house in Newfoundland or something, it's still up from what it was before. So factoring in real estate and those things about the exception of living on Vancouver Island, our economy here is really quite different from the rest of Canada. We don't export a lot of stuff, we don't manufacture a lot of stuff, we don't have a lot of agriculture, and we don't do any manufacturing here. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of our role in the Canadian economy? Well, I mean, I think, you know, like you just said, there's a lot of parts. Well, obviously here in, in Victoria being... Um, uh, you know, they, this, the, the government here, that's a big part of how things work. There's a lot of tourism. So it's, you know, it's like you say, it's an economy that's a little bit more uh, isolated from a lot of things, so it gets less touched like that, and that's kind of part, both its advantages and disadvantages. I don't, you know, it's hard to kind of compare that, kind of say what the different things, but it gives particular challenges to the, the place and kind of having always these innovative aspects that come out of the island. I'm always in, intrigued about seeing kind of some of the new businesses that do come out mm -hmm. in the island that kind of all of a sudden appear in different things and especially uh, even when you say non-agricultural, some things agricultural actually oh, get yeah. exported yeah. out and you kind of get different parts and people are creative and find different things and so I think sometimes that island mentality is both a, a it's certainly a strength on certain dimensions. Yeah, for sure. Um, by the way, the office, there's some people in the room that can help you find office space if you decide to <laughs> okay, do that. Okay, okay. Just saying. Uh, next from the floor, who do we have? Booking up. 
We have time for a few more, by the way. Pete Jando, Audlin Brown, uh, thanks for your comments. Um, raising interest rates, uh, the effect on the economy, there's a lag between when you raise the rates and when the effect is felt, and it can be many months. Uh, what are the indicators you're going to use, the bank is going to use, to determine that they've raised rates enough and it's time to let things, uh, let things slide and, and the natural uh, inflation reduction kind of happen on its own? How, what, what so there's a whole set, use? and we've kind of tried to be quite clear about the type of thing, so it's a very good question. So a lot of the things I mentioned are the things that we'll be looking going forward. So, and that was exactly the aspect, you know, when you said about the, the type, this lag aspect, we had increased a lot, a lot rates uh, during the last year and the kind of coming into this year. And it was exactly that, that we knew it kind of takes a bit of time. That's why we took a pause in January to try to see how things were developing. Different things that we're looking at, like I said, were these underlying measures of inflation. So this kind of core aspect of inflation. What are the kind of aspects that are kind of really ingrained? And that's kind of trying to take out things that are very internationally determined, like uh, energy prices and things, and trying to understand what's happening here. So that's something that we look at a lot. Trying to compare that to kind of the wage growth, the productivity kind of aspect. Is that kind of in line? Will that allow us to get things? How tight is the labor market is another part. We look at expectations. So one of the things that drives, and you're all business people, you have to set prices. Well, when you're setting prices, you're trying to figure out, okay, what do I think others are setting their prices? What am I going to kind of do? What's kind of a price that's reasonable? Those are the expectations. That tells us a lot what kind of prices might happen. We follow those also. So there's a whole set of measures there that we look at to try to get an idea, has this gone in the right direction that we start seeing all these things coming down and getting us back down to that 2%. So we look at a wide variety of things, not one thing. So when I was going back, when we took our pause and what made us change, it's not one element. It's all these aspects of figuring out both whether there's, you know, supply and demand are more in line with one another so that we have not this excess demand in the system as much and looking at all those prices kind of uh, lining up. So yes, a whole set of things. I've uh, got one right there. Yeah. Hi, Josh Ubes, CD Commercial Banking. Great, great talk. I just wanted to pick your brain on if the mandate of the Bank of, Can of Bank of Canada is to lower inflation. Could you please comment on the relationship between unemployment rate and inflation rates, and if the Bank of Canada has done calculations on where unemployment rate should be to meet the two percent uh, goal? Thank you. Yeah. So it, it's I'll take it a bit wider than just the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate's one part in this aspect. So what you want to know is like, is the economy kind of overheating versus the capacity that it can produce, okay? So when, you know, and again, these are you know, a lot of business people, if you're getting so much demand in your system and you're having difficulty produce that, well, what's going to be your response? You're going to increase prices, okay? So we have to figure out what's getting things in line there that this is the amount that can be produced in a sustainable way without everyone just trying to rush through and kind of increase prices. Unemployment rate is one aspect of kind of one part in there of kind of one indicator of the labor market and a certain aspect of the tightness of it and trying to say if the labor market is too tight, that's pushing kind of like the same thing on that front and pushing up the idea of the, the you have to kind of increase your wages to kind of hire people and attract them into your firm. Therefore, then you're going to push those prices, on, those, those wage increases into prices and we're still going to have all that process. So that's one element. So when we look at the, the labor market in particular, we don't look at just the unemployment rate. We look at a whole set of things to try to figure out, does the, un does the labor market look balanced where it could be sustainable at that level without creating this extra pressure that just creates inflation? So it's not one thing, and we have to be careful. Those are, are um, all elements that can change over time, and we track a whole set. So if you go to the um, Bank of Canada website, for example, we have this kind of uh, this big chart of all these indicators of labor market uh, variables that we we track, including uh, the unemployment rate. And we have these regions are kind of saying, okay, this is a region kind of like a region where we think, okay, here it doesn't seem to be much pressure. When you're out of that region, you start figuring out you're starting to have pressure. Well, when we're at historical lows, you're almost always out of that region. And right now, we're out at that region. We're basically at historical lows, and that's the aspect. Now, when things will kind of slow down a bit. We'll be judging through a whole set of measures, trying to figure out whether things happen, but we won't only look at one measure. Great, thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. I'd like to just follow up a point you made earlier, and this is in terms of your anticipation. My name's Tom DeFay, incidentally, sorry for that. 
looking at the energy prices, you said they were one of the major drivers. Uh, I heard recently that uh, investments in green energy for the first time exceeded investments in uh, looking for petrochemicals, for oil. Well, that being the case, and then add to that the fact that Canada's on fire, choking New York, not escaping a lot of people's intention, attention, and there's obviously going to be uh, more momentum to uh, address the issues of climate change. Where do you see oil prices going uh, in the next couple of years? And is that a part of your uh, calculus when you look at the inflation numbers? Can I just quickly get your name and your affiliation too, please, sir? Your name? My name is Tom DePay. My affiliation is independent. Thank you. <laughs> so, so one of the things to directly, yes, oil prices come into our calculations all the time. So we're always trying to figure out, you know, where uh, where things are going to go and uh, bringing that in. And so we take that in. It's it's an important piece. Now, again, when I was talking about those core measures of inflation, then it comes in less, and that's exactly why we try to figure out what how it's affect things. Now. Predicting oil, we have a whole uh, department that's kind of like set up, or uh, at least a whole group that's kind of on that. But it's not an easy part, and so you know we we use d different uh, different models, different things to kind of predict that. But it is a you know a really difficult part. And if you look at things right now, you know often the kind of you know it's, it's as boring as that. The, often the best predictor of where it's going to go is almost where it is now. I mean that's just like just practically when you look at how things are. So it's very hard to predict the, the, the price of oil. When you go further out, then you get into the real, like, so I'm talking like, you know, whether, you know, six months, one year, that's the part that was coming into some of the, the discussion right here. Now, when you look further out, if there is the, um, you know, if countries really do continue investing enough into the renewables, then we should have a fall in that price of oil kind of looking further out. But that's much further out as kind of like that that really takes place, but it is a kind of uh, great indication at least we are having a lot of that investment in renewables, which is kind of making helping part of that transition. But again, with all the smoke we're seeing, it's not fast enough because we're really living through those periods. Thank you. Do a couple more. Hi, my name is Sergei Tsinkovich, Senior Economist with the Ministry of Forests. So you mentioned in your presentation a couple of aspects uh, regarding the structural changes and how the real interest rates were zero or, or even sometimes below zero like in Europe. And you mentioned the investment gap. So in the light of uh, all the commitments to climate change in terms of investment in infrastructure and new technologies and et cetera, do you see that gap shrinking and how do you see the real interest rates uh, in three to five years? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very much one of the points I wanted to make was, you know, we're seeing it going in that direction, but I wouldn't say, and again, when we try to evaluate things, and this is the same thing, us at the bank, the things at the IMF, that up to now is not enough to really pull that up. But you know, if it gets serious enough and even more in that direction, then it should be creating that greater demand. And as countries really take on that, that commitment to kind of get things down to kind of a, where we want it by 2050, uh, it should be cre creating. It's going, but it, yeah, up to now, there's really not been enough to really change that, that process. At least that's the evaluations. And like I say, it's our evaluation at the Bank of Canada, it's the evaluation at the IMF, but I would think the risk, and that's what I've kind of stressed, is not so much what we know right now. The risks are to the upside. And I think if we, uh, again, you know, it's horrible things like these fires, but sometimes that makes the understanding of how important it is to kind of get that, that movement going. And so that's why I'm saying the risk to the upside in that interest rate even though the, the base case is maybe we'll stay where, where it was pre-pandemic unless we get these extra parts. Great, thank you, and down front. Hi there, um, my name is Paul Nursi, I'm the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria, uh, the tourism board here in Victoria, and my question's around household and household confidence. In our business, which is one of the major drivers, that is the one, number one macroeconomic factor, by way of context, we didn't see recovery from 2008 global financial crisis till 2014 when U.S. households start deleveraging from all the challenges they're facing. So looking out two years or three years as all the households need to remortgage their, their you know, I've heard figures of 20 to 40 percent increases in mortgage costs. You know, what are you looking for in terms of um, the confidence of Canadian households in the two, three years ahead? So. So first of all, let me just say that, you know, at the bank, we've exactly, like when we kind of analyze things, we're exactly taking, we have very detailed data of people uh, on the average of, you know, what, you know, what fraction have 
this type of mortgage, when will it become to renewal? So we kind of run that all through, trying to figure out how it affects the, the economy, how it affects them when they're kind of at renewal. So we have all that aspect, and so that's exactly in the line. And so we take that into account in our part. Part of it, what we've been surprised with all that, and this is why I'm saying, you know, the decision, we, you know, in these kind of recent numbers, is despite all this, we've been surprised about the people are going out and buying still a lot of things. That's kind of a bit, bit the more the surprising part is actually that strength among the consumers still there, kind of going out and kind of spending quite a bit. Uh, so while we're kind of worried about part of that, what right now kind of brings us is trying to say, okay, let's just slow down a little bit, kind of get this back, get this inflation kind of back in. So we've been a bit surprised on the strength of the consumer. That's been our kind of part. Now part of that might be this interaction. We're also in a part where we have very tight labor markets and that reduces some of the stress. Like you know, like, okay, maybe I could lose this job but it's not too hard to find another job and that might be a good reason and it's a good thing. So we have to remember when we, like, it's not that we don't like kind of a, a labor market where there's jobs for anyone, it just mustn't be over excessive. And right now there's just a little bit too much. You just have to get things a little bit more quiet down, helping the economy just rebalance and get that kind of supply in line with the, the demand there. And what I hear every day pretty much from chamber members is that there is a burden because of the cost of money right now. We've seen development projects halt, put on hold. So of course we're all very anxious to hear more about what you say about when the rates will go down. So we anticipate that announcement very much and as soon as possible. But we'll see <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> Deputy Bank of Governor, uh, sorry, Deputy of the Bank of Canada, Governor, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, <laughs> Paul, Paul Beaudry, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.